take one of these out and turn it off, please, for the next hour. I'd appreciate it very much. Thank you. <coughs> it, is, uh, it is with great pleasure and an absolute delight on behalf of everybody at the A to welcome Richard Rogers back to the school that he knows well over the years uh, to present some of the recent work of the office. I got up this morning to scribble a few notes by way of an introduction, made a cup of coffee, opened my morning paper, and found a quarter page summary of what's prompting this evening's lecture, which is an opportunity for us to celebrate the work of Richard alongside a remarkable four decade retrospective of work at the Centre Pompidou. And I think it's a fitting a fitting sign of a career that's been dedicated for so long to the, to the public championing of architecture that one can find in the world's most international newspaper, a quarter page advertisement of a show with only two names in that quarter page to say what's going on. And it's of course the Centre Pompidou itself and the name Richard Rogers. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, it, it's absolutely the case that Richard's in a unique position worldwide in architecture today. He not only leads a global practice that you all know well, he is of course a politician and an advisor to mayors, ministers, and other authorities around the world on the topic of architecture, urbanism, and the life of cities today. I think unlike any other figure in the world of architecture today, Richard connects what you could say are the three Ps of our world more than any other practicing figure. The, the world of the profession, the public, and the politicians around whom ideas related to architecture and cities circulate and are achieved in the form of projects and buildings that we all know. <clears throat> it's an activity that he's been doing for very many years and I think it is, is emblematic in, in his role as the chairman, the first ever chairman of the Architecture Foundation which began here in London in the early 1990s and that over its first decade brought together literally thousands of people across London to discuss and debate and learn about architecture and the city that they live in. It's an activity that he still carries on today and has been doing so as a spokesman for this country when raised to the peerage in 1996 as Lord Rogers of Riverside. I think you all know something of his biography. Maybe some of our students aren't aware that Richard is a fifth year prize winner at this school in the year 1959 and soon after left for the United States where he did graduate studies at Yale University and met in 1961 another young architect from this country named Norman Foster to begin a body of work first in the form of uh, an office called Team Four that for, for several years created some of the iconic projects of the 1960s in this country. Um, after that he of course began another incredibly important collaboration with a young architect named, architect engineer named Renzo Piano <coughs> leading to the building that's housing the retrospective going on today, the Centre Pompidou. Uh, and I think one of, the, one of the enduring features of his work and what explains his ability to move between the worlds of architecture, politics, and public life as easily as he does is his deep belief in collaboration and teamwork. It's something that I think when he first settled into a career in the 1960s was slightly out of the orthodox mold of what architecture was meant to be at the time, organized around singular figures, personalities, and projects. His deep belief in teamwork explains not only, I think, important parts of his own biography, but really sets a model that many of us today, in a world that's increasingly multidisciplinary, collaborative, and interactive, can look back to over the past several decades to provide templates for ways of thinking that we all treat as inevitable today. That, those ways of working are really the result of, of people like Richard and the things they've done. To move forward a bit and to say something very briefly about the career here and now, it's been a remarkable year or so in the life of Richard Rogers. In late, 19, in late 2006, the firm received the Sterling Prize for their uh, Madrid Barajas Airport project, which happens to be the largest ever building, I believe, the partnership has ever done. It's something on the order of a million square meters and a billion euros in construction costs. 
Um, later in 2007, of course, Richard is the recipient of the Pritzker Prize Laureate um, held, I think, an incredibly beautiful setting last summer at Inigo Jones Renaissance Masterpiece, the, the Banqueting Hall in, in Whitehall. Uh, 2007 has seen the publication of volume three of the complete works of Richard Rogers by our own Ken Powell, who's edited the series over the last decade. Uh, in 2008, of course, we'll see the completion of a building that I reckon many people here will get to know well, Terminal 5 out at Heathrow, a project that the partnership began, I believe, in the late 1980s, in about 1989. Um, and later this spring, Richard is the selector for a fantastic show that will open at the Design Museum called 2525, which will survey the works of across the design world from the last quarter century. It's a great pleasure, and please join me in welcoming Richard Rogers. Evening. I think let's have the lights off. Let's go. You can see what I'm going to talk about. It's up there. You also heard about my belief in teamwork, that today it's impossible to, on one, to do buildings or cities all on one's own. I've been very fortunate. I've dealt with a vast number of brilliant people, architects, engineers, clients, or colleagues. I've had a long, t a long go, and I'm expecting to go on, if I can. I greatly enjoyed being at the A, but I can only tell you it gets easier as you get older. <laughs> certainly did for me. And that's all a myth about, God, I wish I was young. Forget it. <laughs> right, let's have the first slide. <laughs> I'm going to talk about, go from cities, macro to micro. It's not so much new work, but just work. I am a great believer in cities. It's the only sustainable form of development that we know. I shall talk quite a lot about that. I love all those words related to cities. Citizenship, civil society, and the responsibility to communities which make up cities. The cities where are for the meeting of people, friends and strangers. Cities are our economic engines, and the heart of all our culture. I think you could say that practically everything that has been created in a culture and cultural terms comes from cities. Now I'm using cities in terms of both cities that started 6,000 years ago, the first ones um, in the Near East, um, to, to as well as the massive cities that we're seeing today. So it's just small cities, large cities, any form of conglomeration of buildings where you have le live, work, leisure. Cities are also about seeing what's around you. This is a painting by Masaccio, the first great Renaissance painter, who together with Brunelleschi and Donatello, re, or brought back, shall we say, the Renaissance, the great Greek Renaissance. And again, I put it here because, not only because of art, and let's face it, you know, ar ar architecture, as we all know, is both art and science. It's both factual and about the use of the imagination. It's a, the art is as important, but cannot as are, as the science. But the two have to work together. Next, I'm fascinated by the whole concept of communities, of people getting together. This is part of the office. We very much believe in the community co and people coming together for one of the many parties. Next. We have a constitution which tries to express the concept of the coming together of people and the responsibility beyond the individual and the responsibility beyond the office or even the profession. As you can see from that, we believe not only in teamwork, but we also believe in the responsibility to both one's own team and to others. The practice is actually owned by a charity. In other words, we as directors don't have shares, we don't buy shares, we don't sell shares, we don't have anything to do with it. 
we don't believe that work should be owned. We live pretty well, I have to quickly say. <laughs> what we do instead is we have a system which, when you, uh, that uh, divides profits in, by, into charity and profit share. And a system also which basically the senior director gets six times the lowest paid architect after two years. I happen to be the chairman, so I get nine times. Um, and the rest of this goes in that, in a recognition, not so much the f in the terms of what one earns or what one doesn't earn, but there's a recognition that you know, we all have to pull together. And I will go more into this as we move. Now that we have a global network, we also have a global knowledge and global responsibility. Each, uh, each employee donates to a, his, own, his or her charity and has a, f a piece of that charity that is responsible to give to a recognized charity. There are certain works which we don't take on, such as military work and so on. So that, con that has an advantage in one way, hopefully, for those who we can reach out to, but it also creates a, a strong community spirit. We do a lot of things together. We all went off to Paris, about 200 of us, uh, about a, m a month ago, I guess, to for the opening of the exhibition. We spent three days in Paris. Uh, before that, we were in Barcelona and so on. We travel around, we have, we have get-togethers, Guy Fawkes days, and all the rest of it. Again, it's about the coming together. And some of those mem memories, of course, are rooted in the spirit of the A, which certainly uh, drove me and the original founder partners who all went to the A, or one of which is here, Mike Davis. Next. So, moving on with cities and the concept of cities. The only way to manage urban growth is by creating compact cities driven by social inclusion, quality of architecture, the art, and environmental sustainability. So again, it's not any one thing, it's a series of elements of those which drives design and architecture and the quality of life, the vitality of cities. Next. This is a photograph at night time, I'm sure you've seen it before, of Europe. You can do it globally, of course, just as well. And what you realize is that cities, first of all, are the dominant factor. Uh, in England, 90% of us live in cities. We're the densest city after Bangladesh, or we could say England and the Netherlands are the two densest cities after Bangladesh. Not dense in terms of, the, uh, of cities themselves, which we actually have very low density, by a, but if you divide the number of people into the land, we are at high density. Therefore, even more reason to protect not only the rural, but to densify the cities that we have. We are now in an urban world, 50% of the world is, uh, is urban, as you can see, it used to be, not 100 years ago it was 10%, we're now 50%, and we'll be 75-80% uh, in another 40 years. Next. The most threatening problem that we're facing today is climate change. The only source of energy is the sun, there is no other source. And we have to look at what energy we have if we're not going to have a tilt within society which will destroy society. It won't destroy, destroy the globe, but it will dest destroy the society that we live in if we have a cl uh, the climate change which we are expecting. So we have to look at all the elements which, do which we can get the energy from, which is not from carbon. The wind, the earth, the sun, chemicals, and so on. Next. We have to reduce climate change by at least two degrees by 2050. Probably the only way we're going to do it is on one side, invention of new materials or new ways and the capturing of clean energy. And I suspect we'll have to, well, I'm sure, we'll have to tax carbon. Climate change affects us all. It affects us all also because many of the wars that we're seeing, seeing are directly the results of poverty. Much of we're seeing what's happening in the Middle East and in, and in Africa is because there's not enough food, because there is not enough distribution of wealth. There is the wealth, but not the distribution of it. So we are seeing starvation, brutality, 
and all forms of extremism. So climate change has not only an architectural, but also a deeply social meaning. We all know about the storms. We all know about what we see ourselves with our own eyes. But even more important, what the scientists have calculated. The disappearance of both poles, for instance. Next. There are some very good examples, and I shall be talking about examples. I mean, the Network Society has allowed us to know what's going on in different places. We can find from the net, from the net, from the net what's going on in Brazil, in Curitiba, or Bogota, in Colombia. Very, very sustainable cities. Very good transportation, for instance, in both those. What's going on in Portland, in the USA, very interesting, Vancouver, um, Barcelona here, and so on. Those are the good examples. The bad examples, they're too numerous to discuss. <laughs> Barcelona on the, on the left used to be a, one of the most, the, the seaside was one of the most derelict ports I've ever seen when I first, when we first, when I first went to Barcelona. And the great city was completely cut off from the sea by a port which had been, I think, more, one of the biggest ports in, on the Mediterranean. Fifteen years later, it started to look like this. Now it's 25 years later. The Olympics were one of the levers towards the reclaiming, the densification, and the reclaiming of the land and the great sort of uh, parks and shops and residential and, and port areas, yachting and so on. And the whole dream of building where so that you can live and swim practically in the same, uh, within a, a few minutes of each other, a real integration of the public space amenities with the private space. This has been done by, partly by the drive of three mayors by a very, who brought a, a cultural consciousness to Barcelona. I mean, it's a great city before, of course. It had tremendous advantages before. But it's fascinating to watch what Spain is doing after 40 years of fascism. The drive, the cultural drive of Spain, in my opinion, is, without, is the most interesting within the European continent. Next. So sustainable cities, we have the knowledge and the tools to build sustainable, compact, and multi-centered communities that are well-designed, supports a diverse range of uses, includes both the poor and the rich, is environmentally responsible, encourages walking, and are integrated with public transport, adaptable to change, secure and, ju and just. What's fascinating is that practically all cities are battling towards this, this uh, position. There's very little e disagreement between the different cities of the world. Now, some haven't got much either wealth or knowledge, wealth in terms of knowledge. But if you find those p people who are trying to, to work towards sustainable cities, then there's a general agreement that these sort of elements are the driving forces. Next. I should be talking quite a lot about the compact city, the compact polycentric city, a city which is contained. We're very fortunate in, in, in London, we have a green belt, but it's really a corset or a belt. Where growth is stopped from going outside until one's used all the what we call brownfield land or derelict land or previously used land, and even an equally important where we densify, but we also densify the buildings so as to, uh, which are of low density around transportation hubs. So we need to unlock higher land values by li limiting development to previously developed land and improve public transport and encourage walking. So again, recycling of, of buildings and land. The new towns were a considerable advance on what we had, have done before. But until, more so I'm going to say, the last 10 years, the concept was really to gentrify and to green, bring green into our cities and to move people out. Over the last 10 or 15 years, this has been reversed. The idea is we need to attract people back. Therefore, cities have to be much better designed. They have to, have, they have to give you more jobs, more enjoyment, more living within that city. Ideally, cycling, walking being the major element, public transport, being the other. So the city has to encourage people back. Now there's been a general 
movement out from cities. And only in the last, again, I'm going to say decade, has, a, has there been a, a movement back, especially in city centers, such as, for instance, city, Manchester, the very center of Manchester, 10 years ago, had 90 people living in the center. Today, it's 3,000. Now, it's, I'm looking at a, a, a block or oh, blocks, but the point I'm making is people are moving back. They're, they're rediscovering the, the uses of cities. And of course, again, if you don't do that, if you start to go out of the cities, then you have a, a car-driven society. And of course, as far as cars are concerned, there's nothing about community. They disperse, they're a dispersal. They tend to be sort of machines on tanks on wheels, if you like, on rubber wheels. So the concept, again, is to get people together to exchange ideas, to realize that there are poor people and there is a very poor distribution of wealth throughout most countries. Very seriously in England, we have four out of the 20 poorest areas that, uh, in Europe, by the way, in London itself. And yet London is by far the richest city in Europe. So distribution of wealth is extremely poor. And that affects our living, our quality of life, and of course, it affects our cities and our city life. Next. This is a very, uh, an old image, but it's a perfectly good one to use. With, and this is East Manchester. This is before the Commonwealth Games came here. It's a study I did for the Urban Task Force, which I had the fortune to cha chair towards an urban renaissance, which prepared a, a large report, which in a sense drives the uh, Labour Party um, urban regeneration programs today. Here, in this area here, in, there are about four out of five dwellings who are actually unlivable in, empty, derelict. Obviously, when you get to that state, everybody can sort of find a couple of pennies to rub together, moves out, leaving just the poor or, and the sick behind. And they move out because they can't afford to move in, or there's not spaces, so they move out towards the, the suburbs and the countryside. What we did, the study we did was to look, and this is a study actually by the practice, um, which looked at Manchester and said, you know, the, the big, that big circle is the center of Manchester. These are district centers, one, two, three, four possibly. Then you have community centers or feeding into it. This is a transportation system linking those communities. And you have what we tend to call the fried egg diagrams, which are these diagrams here, which are high density around the transportation interchange, Lower density as you move out, clear definitions of, edge, of, of edges or morally clear definitions of edges. Now this has changed. Manchester has changed a lot, especially this area has changed a lot. And we are beginning to see a movement back of people into even this area as well as into the, into the center. Next. That's the basic diagram, should we say, the Renaissance and previously uh, designed uh, with a uh, partnership design which shows the anatomy of a city, the concept of a high-density center of di districts, of di varying densities, linking of, uh, linking of transport, and a sort of section which starts to tell you with sort of, uh, a park in the center, then you're going down and so on. Um, so clear urban districts and, district and districts and neighborhoods. Obviously, it's a diagram. Next. So at the heart of all this, it's we must rebuild the empty quarters of our cities to bring vitality and security before expanding into the countryside. Again, compactness, live, work, leisure, well connected. Next. One of the, one of the things which obviously drives people out, which pulls people out of the cities, is out of, out of town, out of city development. The shopping centers, and this is a, a chart that shows you from 1980. For, and since, I'm going to say, the beginning of shopping centers, let's say in the sort of 60s, England did rather well. We had a pretty flat curve. We had about a million square meters for up to 1985. Then Thatcher came in, took the controls off, and up we went by about five times in about the same number of years, sucking all the sort of much of the wealth and much of the movement out of the city. Now, when you move out, of course, First of all, if, if you move out, it's mainly middle class who move out. It's mainly people with skills who move out, again, leaving the poor behind. Here, not only do they, people move out and they begin to have suburban sprawl, but of course, the shopping, shopping centers not only, not only 
took out the wealth out of the cities, either shops and so on, and all the market towns collapsed within about five years when this happened. But it also means that everybody goes by car. When I say everybody, the 50% who have cars go by car. The 50% who don't have cars, of course, are stuck and in, trapped into the city. So one of the attempts has been and is, is to now even this off. It hasn't even got fast enough because a lot of, it, a lot of planning is still, a lot of shopping centers are still in the pipeline and sometimes one doesn't get the results. But the good news is that uh, we've now got to about 75% of all the land that's developed in England is on brownfield, on derelict land. Uh, in London, and I'll probably mention it later on, uh, more is 100% is on brownfield land. And that gives the densification, and of course, architecture is fascinating, uh, the implications of this, rather than developing within a sort of uh, a, a the country, a countryside or suburban development. The same goes for business parks, the same goes for, for my, my point of view, from my point of view, I'm, any form of out-of-town development until all the brownfield land is used up. Now, interestingly enough, it's 10 years ago since I chaired the Urban Task Force, the amount of actually brownfield land is exactly the same as it was 10 years ago. And actually, there is more land because, of course, the density actually has gone up by about four times the average uh, density of development from 10 years ago. Therefore, you can put much more on to that brownfield land. So there's even more brownfield land. So I'm contrary to what we keep on seeing in the press, which says, well, now that we are meant to be building over 200,000 dwellings a year, by the way, we, would, we were developing 300,000 uh, dwellings a year in the 50s and 60s. So it's interesting we can't get to there. And in Spain, it's again interesting, because they've got a smaller population than England, uh, they develop some 100,000 uh, dwellings a year. So we really have a problem uh, in the form of our house building. Um, but the point I want, to, uh, I want to make is that there is now a beginning of a recognition that you've got to contain the city and that there's still a and contained until the city is truly compact. Now, compact doesn't mean high rise or low rise. Again, back to Barcelona, the highest density in, in Europe is Barcelona. And there's only about there's a handful of, of buildings over eight stories. So eight story but good planning gives you a fantastic high density. You have to go to New York to get that type of high density. There you do get high density. But in Europe, we, we, ha we don't have it really. And nor, you, I mean, we may need it in a, for many different reasons. Offices work very well, uh, high rise, for instance. Dwellings much less well. Um, but there are obviously other reasons for having high buildings, not least identity. Next. Here's a project we did, again, uh, 12 years ago. Pudong, uh, to Shanghai, this is Shanghai, the Bund, the, uh, tributary of the Yangtze River, fabulous river. At this point, there were no bridges, nothing across this. There's sort of suburban sprawl, small sheds and so on, on this side. Wonderful 19, 19, uh, sorry, early 20th century buildings all along the edge of this great river. And you, just, you can start seeing all the, all the way there. And they are, we, are, we were asked to do by the mayor was to plan or make a strategy for putting a million people on this area here. When we heard of a million people, we thought that's crazy. You know, in England, if we build 30,000 people, that's a really big new town. Um, in actual fact, I went back 10 years later, uh, 11 years later, and, uh, oh, uh, and they'd built 11 million, added 11 million people to it. They'd built more than New York in 10 years and added it to the, to the city. You'll see, I'll show you a picture in a moment. Um, so the concept was, how did you tie this together? How do you create a sustainable environment on that side? Next. And this is, a, again, a diagram. And that's the Great Bund. The first thing they did, by the way, is they managed to, this beautiful Bund, which you could look out to the river, they put a car park right, they put a one-story car park right along here. So you couldn't see the river any longer from the streets. <laughs> Um, and in fact, when I, went to see, when I um, first met the mayor of Shanghai, and I said, fantastic, you have uh, 10, 11 million people, uh, and you have 7, 8 million bicycles. And he said, don't worry, we're going to ban bicycles by the end of the century. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas also, I was trying to congratulate him. And he was saying that is a sort of backward. <laughs> Luckily, he hasn't, but it is very different, the bicycle now. Um, in this. But that concept was that we would tie with transportation, you'll see it in a moment, create a series of uh, towns, should we say districts, kind of towns really, 
um, with six uh, districts um, with uh, nearly 200,000 people in each one of these, built along a railway, light railway system over here, with central parks with avenues branching off it, and everybody could either be within 10 minutes of a park, one park or the other, or the great the, the river, the river park over here. All the high buildings were based around the centre, and as I said, transport, public transport linked across. Now there, there is a lot of more public transport. Next. This there is the live work concept. There's the private park, um, and he, this is the big sort of. And I said it's a diagram, but this is the big avenue with a light railway or tram, if you like, travelling through this over here. And these are the tall buildings on the edges, and the buildings go downwards. This is to allow the wind and the sun to enter into the buildings, to so one can need to use the, the minimum of cooling um, and the maximum of view and breezes and catch it, capture the breezes. That's the calculations of the energy, and what it basically says is you can easily reduce a third of the energy in terms of buildings, but if you can do the planning as well, you can use, lose another, you can lose a sixth, uh, you can use a, use a sixth of the normal amount of energy. This is just a, a diagram of the concept of, sustainable, of sustain, sustainable energy. Next. Now, this is what it looks like now, um, and, it and it has nothing to do with what we built, because actually they were they more or less built all the infrastructure before we'd even finished the first year's drawings. Um, so we weren't, it was impossible to, to, uh, to do anything. And of course it's lost most of the qualities of the old city over here, which is one, walking, cycling, um, and, uh, and, and public transport. And it is nearly impossible to walk in this, in this area because of the amount of cars, the amount of tarmac, and the amount of heat that's reflected from the tarmac. When they first came back with the, with the drawings, which were sort of an interpretation of our scheme, they said, what do you think of it? And one of the first things we did, we calculated the amount of tarmac. Now, an average city like London or New York has about the same, about 16% is the tarmac surface. Uh, this had actually 60%, 60. Um, they then came back again and said, well, we've done what you asked us, and actually they, 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 what they sort of misunderstood our point, they had to remove 16% from their 60. I suppose it was better than nothing. But then they went up again anyhow, so it didn't make much difference. Um, now, it's fantastic the amount of energy here. You know, there's a fantastic the willingness uh, to, uh, to, to industrialize, to have jobs, to have full employment. All those things that one can but admire. And as you know, the production is amazing. When I, again I asked um, the mayor when he came over here, and he gave a fantastic speech um, about, uh, about Shanghai, and I asked him, well, what about environmental sustainability? And he gave one of those answers, which I shall never forget, which was, Yes, it is absolutely important. This is some years back. Uh, I think it's critical, he said. But first we'll have to catch up the produ USA production, and then we'll think about the environmental sustainability. Well, OK. <laughs> and you, sh you can see the problems, because after all, we've done it, so why shouldn't they benefit from it? I mean, in other words, we've done it in terms of, you know, we've burnt, burnt up our heritage. Uh, why shouldn't they, they have a good chance, and, but got jobs and, and money? And so that's part of the problems as we know. Now, I do think things are, have become more sophisticated than uh, when I, than 11 years ago, or even when I asked the mayor, which is probably five years ago. But still, the problems are extremely serious, and clearly we're going towards the tilting edge, the tilting point in terms of whether society can survive on this planet. Next. A couple of moments on London. I'm hoping at the end of this we're going to be able to have a, a talk to exchange uh, views and ideas. I advise the mayor on architecture and, urban and urbanism. Uh, I do one day a week. My Wednesdays I go to City Hall and work with a, t a team um, of prime, many of architects, a small team, um, to look at London. And I have to say I thoroughly enjoy it and I thoroughly enjoy working with Ken Livingston. Whatever dispatches might have said yesterday, which I didn't see but I did read about it. <laughs> um, he's a highly decisive person, and he has brought, I think, considerable uh, culture and wealth to the city. It's a fantastic city, and it's changed immensely over the last 10 years, 15 years. Uh, I think street life and consciousness of what a city can offer has increased tenfold more and more uh, over the last couple of decades. 
And of course, the, the greatest single public space probably is the river, and it's still under, underused, but it's becoming more used. Next. We're looking at a population growth of around, well, in the next, uh, let's say, well, in the next 15, 20 years, uh, of about six, 800,000 people. Uh, 20 years is probably a million people. So it's a growth from about uh, six and a half million to towards eight million. Uh, we've gone up already from six and a half to seven, even in the few years that, that from 2001 to 2000 uh, to now. Um, so if it's very important to draw people in, as I've said. If, you don't have, if people are leaving, you really can do very little with your cities. But if people are moving, you've got a tremendous potential. We need 400,000 dwellings. The mayor, we have said, you've got to keep the green belt. We've got to reinforce the green belt. Now, the green belt has some areas which are not green. I'm not going to argue about, the, uh, about whether there should be no movement at all. Though, on the whole, there are more important things than to argue, in my opinion, whether we should expand on some of the less successful parts of the green belt. Um, so all, the mayor has stated, all construction, all development will be uh, within, on brownfield land, on previously used land. 50 we're aiming towards 50% of affordable housing. There was practically nothing developed in affordable housing between 1980, uh, 1980 and uh, I'm going to say until the Labour Party came back in. Um, major public transport, not enough any, by a long way, but of course uh, there is the beginning of investment in crossrail and in better transport. We can get to Paris in a couple of hours. It's a hell of a lot less energy, about 90%. About 10, we use about 10% per person of the energy if you go by train, as if, if you, uh, instead by, if you go by plane. Increased density around public transport hubs, that's a critical part of the development plan. Congestion charges, putting the money from congestion charges into public transport. And obviously, get more jobs, get more inequality, more equality, and a 60% reduction in CO2 by 2025. That's sort of some of the things that which London is trying to do, and certainly London has become an exemplar. I have to say, if I, about the poorest thing in London is design. I mean, the quality of actual development, is, especially if it's housing, is appalling. And the sort of, in my, the six big house builders um, have really got, are doing an appalling job, I think, let's put it that way. Um, in the end, you know, they control the house building. The market process that we have in Britain is one which basically gives house builders a tremendous power. Uh, the same used to be said about offices. We could say that probably 20 years ago, but offices have changed. And offices, because they're mainly let, there's long-term interest. House builders, houses are basically sold and therefore there's no long-term interest. And they're also not done, as in on the continent, they're not by big organizations. Uh, they're usually large insurance firms, they're large investment firms that build house building. Here it's very much limited to house builders. Now, planning is also pretty slow and pretty terrible, and we could do a lot better with, with that. And of course, environmental sustainability, we have a long way to go. Next. Green belt, I've already mentioned. This has been, this is, what's fascinating, is that most of the big thoughts that came out of uh, Britain in the last 50 years came out during the, the war, 1942, 1945. London Plan, for instance, um, created this, uh, the concept of the, of, the, of the Green Belt. And that is something which one has to admire. Next. The major expansion, most of the dwellings, are towards the east. That's where all the industry was. Industry was there mainly because the winds came from the, from the west to the east, so people moved out of, uh, moved, growth was mainly to the west. Now we're growing out towards the east. There's much less industry anyhow. Lots of good brownfield land. The Olympics are going to be there. And what you hear, the sort of, what we, get in, we call the fried egg diagrams, which are around transportation hubs. This is a situation more or less now. It's getting, um, the big change, obviously, is Canary Wharf. Uh, Fifteen years Canary ago, Canary Wharf was just sheds. Now it's a massive urban regeneration. We're looking about redevelopment. The first major redevelopment is happening in the Olympics around here, in this area here. And we're looking to re uh, what we call City East. We're looking towards a city of designing a city or building a city for about uh, half a million people. 
a city about the size of Leeds in that area. Plenty of land there and plenty of potential, lots, and also lots of interesting, water, uh, lots of great water areas for the Royal Docks, <coughs> the Lee Valley, and so on. So what one's looking at is starting to create a large city in this area here, leaving this part here to, for future development, um, and that's, that's L London itself. Next. Also look, and again using uh, the GLA, the mayor, uh, we're looking towards creating a lot of new public spaces, no, a lot of it, and also of extending existing public spaces. Um, one, of the, one of the parks that I hope we'll be able to build is, and uh, this is part of a project that we've, uh, which the partnership put forward in 1986 in uh, London as it could be, the idea of a big park all the way down the, the northern side. Now, on the southern side, that has changed probably more than anything else. Probably that's the best urban regeneration maybe we have in, in Britain, certain best urban regeneration in, in London. So now, for the f and we, you couldn't do this 15 years ago, you can now walk, as you all know, all along the south side and the fantastic festivities, um, there are lots of cultural activities, there's live and work and leisure as, as well. The north side hasn't benefited from this. Uh, it's cut off, the Thames, the Thames is cut off uh, by this b large road, um, and I mean, this is the water used to lap into here, of course, uh, Somerset House. There again, this is going, this has gone pretty much public with skating, bars, and so on on that side. Next. So the concept is that you'll, there'll be a park. Unfortunately, we will have to leave a road there for a while, but we will slowly uh, close bits of it, we hope. Um, so as to try and create, well, to link all the existing gardens all the way l along the north side and start to feed that up into the Strand and into the areas beyond. So you will have a park facing primarily south, and on the other side you'll have a fantastic wharf which is already, already built on the southern side. Next, now there are about 100 public spaces, like, uh, well, we've called them 100 public spaces. In fact, we've got about 35 of them, which we're creating in different parts of London. Uh, as much uh, in, the, in the poorer areas and in, as, as anywhere else. So, to summarize a little bit, we're increasing density. Planned density brings v vitality to communities, to make business prosper, and to make transport and other services viable. We want to create diversity, that's a mix of people, uh, live, work, leisure, rich and poor. The value of public spaces, I've already talked about, for, and you know, it's, uh, the public spaces are the, really the, you know, the living rooms of our cities. Uh, again, that means well-designed pavements rather than badly, well-designed roads, well-designed street furniture to attract people, to, in, make, to allow people to enjoy themselves outside. Reuse of land, uh, of, of brownfield land, um, and densification of, it, uh, of that land. But of course, green spaces, the higher the density, the better your design has to be, the more you have to understand the role of, of, of semi-private and private spaces, or open spaces as well as public spaces. Improved, uh, and improve public transport, walking and cycling. Next. Moving f rather violently from cities, but there is only, it's only a question of scale, if you like, which is one of the points I, I, I'm making. This was a house built in about in 1967-68 with a partnership uh, Richard, uh, uh, myself, and Sue Rogers. Um, and uh, it's in Wimbledon for my parents. And here you see some of the concepts which has, I could say, have driven our architecture forward. Of course, we've learned lots from other places. We're back to the, you know, where do you learn? Case study houses, Eames House, Soriano and so on, the Sherrill House. Um, from uh, much of what's going on at the AA, which I'll talk about in a moment, at the time that I was here. This all ha influenced. Uh, uh, so the basic language here is one of high fluidity, in other words, flexibility. This house is now used by, uh, by one of my sons with his two kids and wife. Uh, it's a design shop much more, rather than this is a, a this and said my parents, well, my mother was a, a potter, my father was a doctor. So a totally different in, environment. Uh, their furniture was 1930 Bauhaus. His furniture is today. And he keeps on asking me, well, why don't I get rid of my, my uh, Corpse antique furniture and my Eames antique furniture? I haven't quite caught on, but I'll, I'll get there one day. <laughs> uh, integration between outside and inside, um, lightweight panels, clear span, 
clarity of structure, process of construction, dictating the way you put, put the form together, giving you clues about how the building go, goes together. Easy legibility. I use this word very often. The word a building should, you could, should, should be able to read how it goes together. And many buildings you know, are, are changing. Therefore, it's no good saying, you know, a house is a thing with a pitched roof because a house can be, you can live in a warehouse. And as I often point out, the best club in Rome is in a church, which brings up the question, what's a church and what is a club? Um, so the concept of image has nearly been eroded because of change. So here you begin to see the language of which we use. Next. This is actually uh, my cousin, Nessa Rogers' furniture, which uh, is 1930s, in which I call it Bauhaus, and my mother said it was a potter. And this is how it was. It, it's now changed, but it has ad adapted pretty well. Next. So some of the key words we use in terms of buildings, but you could also adapt those to cities, light and transparent, lightness, legibility and order, process of construction, scale, grain and rhythm, flexibility and adaptability, sense of place, private and public, environmental sustainability. Light and transparent, again, you know, less material, transparency, I mean, for me, both view for me and place is probably the most important thing. I have to have, I love views. I love lots of light. So light and transparency becomes very, very important to me. Lightness, legibility, that's giving order to the building. So does the process of construction. Scale, grain, rhythm, I mean, that's part of the art of architecture. Actually, they're all part of the art of architecture. Flexibility and adaptability, <laughs> sense of place. I mean, if you take that famous trip, which I keep on writing about down the Thames, you will be shocked about. There's no development practically along that Thames which has any sense of place whatsoever. Private and public, we've talked a bit about it on cities, and our very environmental sustainability. We've also talked about the critical, the critical problems facing us. Next. Architecture transforms the ordinary by giving order, scale, and beauty to space. I think that's basically what we're all trying to do. Next. Competition at Santa Pompidou in 1971, Renzo and I got together about a year and a half before. Um, on the, uh, one of the major reasons we got together, we thought we, we were both unemployed and we thought it would be more fun being too unemployed than on our own. We had a few friends um, uh, and we, had a th we were trying to run practices. We were persuaded by Ovarops to do the Pompidou competition. I was against it from the, from the start. Um, and I couldn't, you know, I'm an old lefty. Um, and I couldn't understand why you would want a cult centralized culture. I didn't want to do a palace for a president. And all the rest of the things which, you know, as a young 30-year-old, I sort of wrote down on a piece of paper, all the reasons why we shouldn't do it. Fortunately, I lost in the argument. And we did do it, and by some miracle, we won it. Um, but the building is very much about that period. It's very much about 1968, the, the whole student revolution, the intellectual revolution, especially in France, but, the, but across both Europe and the USA. The this is the competition elevation, and sort of expresses the, that political period. The first lines of the report, which I wrote, I don't remember, said, a place for all people, all ages, all creeds. It's also, uh, it, it was a fun palace as well as being a cross, which we, so we say, with British, the British Museum. You may have, some of the images, there is, where I mean, you can see, probably can read, there was about Vietnam. Again, it was a sort of semi-political statement about the, st the state. But the idea of the facade was that it was com could be able to communicate to the people. So the public domain was the great piazza, you'll see, and then the facade of the building was a continuation of the public domain of the piazza all the way up the building. And then it was a loose framework, and you filled it in as you wanted. Big escalators uh, going across the facades, absolutely clear spaces between the two structural walls, back and front, if you like, um, and again, a clear expression of how the building is put together. Next. This is the site. It was a, a parking space uh, when we were there in the, after the war. Before the war, uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was an area which was uh, made derelict in the, in the middle 1930s. It was made derelict because this was the main brothel area, and 
some politician thought was the way to get rid of prostitution was to remove the buildings. The prostitutes were much more intelligent to move one street back. Um, but we came, with, the actual site was here. We, there was a tiny bit which we had to pull down on this side, and here it came, music research station, uh, the music research center, which is just here, Boulez's, which Mike Davis over there was in charge of. Um, and as we said, we did this competition without, uh, I think, much regard of whether we would win it or not, but with great enjoyment, which always helps. Next. This is the building. You'll see quite a few changes in, from the competition, but I think the spirit is very much the same. The changes are partly to do with, um, for instance, the height of the building, which was about a third higher than, than this, was then limited when we got to the reality of the site, was limited actually to the height of a fireman's ladder. Uh, in other words, a fireman's ladder can get up to this main floor here. Um, and then another thing, which was things like economics. When I, when I said to the client, and we had a fantastic client without which we could never have built this building. You know, why, are we, uh, why, why weren't we told about the budget? He, told, he said to us, well, we didn't want to restrain your ideas. And I said, you sure have now. <laughs> and of course, the budget controlled much of the size and, and the concepts which you saw before uh, in that co competition uh, elevation. So here, this is the place for all people. Um, and here's the... the Obviously, they escalated with the views across uh, uh, Paris. And the idea of a structure, as we, had, we worked with Arabs, with this brilliant engineer, Peter Rice, who unfortunately has now uh, unfortunately died. And with a great team of people, we grew from practically no, a handful of people to about 20, 25 um, people who, and as I said, working with, with, with Arabs and other consultants, and led by this very brave chairman of the client body, who when asked, what have you, why are you, when I, uh, uh, what have you built before? He said, no, no, nobody, but I was in charge of most of the French withdrawal from, its, from their colonies. And of course, that was the sort of person you really needed because we, we were under attack from the beginning. And we have to remember that Europe didn't ha there was no Europe. France was completely isolated. England was even more isolated. And the idea of having foreign architects here was completely, we were taken to court continuously um, because, we were, because we were foreigners. Um, until they changed the law. Um, but there were, it was a very tough period, and as I said, thanks God for the client, because I don't think, the only good part about this on our part was that we were so naive that we thought everything was possible, and that does help when you really believe that everything is possible. Next, there's the machine, if you like, the, arc, the building within its site, there's the same uh, down there. Mechanical services on one side, structure on the other. Next, this is the basic diagram the great piazza in the front, the sunken piazza. <coughs> the big e entrance space now, unfortunately, become much too meek, more or like a sort of office lobby, but still the big entrance space. And total flexibility on the floors. When I remember, we had a, obviously we were biased, we had a fantastic jury. Uh, Philip Johnson, Nima, Jean Prouvé was the chairman, head of the British Museum, head, head of the Netherlands Libraries, and so on. And this was the first big competition in Europe and the only one, other one was of any size was, was the Sydney Opera House, which is obviously in Australia. And so the idea was that we wouldn't draw plans. And I remember when Philip Johnson came to see us one morning, or he came here at about 9 o'clock and nobody was in the office, and that was probably because we went to bed at about 6 o'clock. Um, and we were all in bed and he was furious, but more importantly he said, and where are the plans? And I said, there ain't no plans because it's all flexible space. And we really don't mind where the museum goes at this point of the game, or where the, where the library goes, or where the cinemas go, or where the restaurants go, or where the design museum goes, and so on. So was, this is the idea of a comp total flexible space with the structure and services on one side, structure and services of movement on the other side, and that form of fluidity. The basic structure, which was a compression, compression column with a tension rod on the outside with these great brackets. Next. And this idea of people attracting people, and of course, we were very fortunate again, this is Paris, and you know, going on, a, on walking promenade um, is a great activity in Paris, so they took to it. When the, build, uh, the building was absolutely hated, we, we were nearly slaughtered. By, and there wasn't a single media piece for the whole of the six years we were building it, apart from one newspaper, which I remember only too well, it's so unique, which is the New York Times by Ada Lewis Huxtable. 1973, um, who had said anything good about the building, but moment, the moment it opened, 
and people started to line up outside, then the, all the press changed and all the media changed. Um, but anyhow, the concept obviously was this, to uh, maximize the, the pleasure of movement, that you didn't have to go into a sort of squeezed co corridor internally, sque or a lift where sort of your head would be sort of, if you're small, squeezed in somebody else's stomach, but actually be able to look out in lots of space and have enjoyment of, mo of, mo of movement. Next. And the, you know, the expression, the link between engineering um, and the, the advances in engin uh, engineering, these are great, massive 10 ton castings. And the whole, you know, the design, architecture is about detail. And, you know, Renzo would make, put it even more strongly. Renzo literally works very much from the small to the big. Um, I think we probably work from, from both sides. But the, you know, the whole way they clips together is very much much about what the building is in it. That's what gives scale. That's what the grain of the building. That's what the rhythm of the building is about. Is about. Uh, water fill columns because of fire and so on. Next. And again, the relationship between the hand and the scale of, of the pieces uh, and, uh, and, and, and the building. And that fact, buildings are made of parts. Are not j and the, it's not really about height or length. It's about the, the grain of the b and the play of light and shadow on mass. Next. We've got a big exhibition, as you heard. Thank you for the uh, PR I got free. Um, and the exhibition is on for another, until I think April, the th uh, sorry, until March the 3rd. Um, and this is the Pompidou. I mean, part of the exhibition is not only about our work, um, but also bringing some of our, the ideas we originally had in, po uh, in the Pompidou to life. This is like a big sweet shop. Um, as Mike Davis says. It's an idea, and you can look from the outside, it's a street level and it's a shop. Um, and that was very much the idea of the Pompidou Center, that it was transparent, that you could look outwards and you could see what's going on inwards, that there were no barriers between de uh, departments, that there should be paintings in the museum, uh, so <laughs> paintings in the library and books in the museum and so on. We didn't succeed in some of those things, but it hasn't improved, I have to say. At, 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 at. And of course, one of the problems of, of bureaucracy is it loves compartmentalization. Next. This is Lloyd's of London, um, just a little piece here. We are, there's a building which we're now building, which is opposite Lloyd's of London, um, a nearly 50-story building, shaped like this for offices, because there's a view of St. Paul's, which is about here, around here. Um, so it shapes to get out <laughs> backwards. Um, you can't quite see it because it's around the corner. Um, and um, the concept again is the very large public space, seven story public space, partly glazed but actually free at ground level, free for the first four meters and, and more. So you can just move from the small square straight into the building. The structure is easily is legible, uh, triple glazing. This is the CU building, which it used to be called the CU building, it's now something else. The side of the, or the back of the building is the mechanical services, the elevator, the lifts, the toilets and so on at the back. The building sort of leans up against that. And it is, again, it, it's it considered in considerable detail in terms of uh, energy efficiency. Next, the entrance uh, which I, and the continuation of the piazza under the building, the sort of seven-story space. It's got shops, it's got activities with cafes and so on, activities within it. Next, the Welsh Assembly, Welsh Parliament, uh, Cardiff Bay. And they, here again, the concept was a large roof, what we term a democratic roof, sheltering the public domain. The public domain more steps which come out of the, out of the sea, out of the bay, go all the way through and then you go up and that's all public domain. The parliament, the assembly is actually below ground, you'll see at the moment. This is for cooling, so these are actually for, so the ventilation moves through the building. There is glass round here, next. And this is a section, so this is all public domain through here. And in fact, what's nice about it is, that, you know, there are prams and old people and, 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 uh, and so on all the way through this, this building. Um, and you look down at the assembly, which is the right relation between people and the assembly. You look down into the assembly through gaps into those edges. Next. Next. And people looking down at the assembly around the edges there. Next. And finally, Madrid Airport, the largest building that we've designed so far. Um, note, note this so far. Uh, 
Um, <laughs> opened about a year and a half ago, about 1.2 kilometers long. Uh, the main terminal, the satellite over here. It's rather, looking the other way, it's a rather beautiful sight. That here you, are, you have hills and, and hills on this side all the way around. So the roof sort of does some of that movement, the same movement, because it's so long, it gets, you start to get this rhythm across the stainless steel roof and you get this rhythm across the roof. Next. This is the actual diagram. You can see there's the roof itself. Um, there are some the gorges, we cut straight into, so that the, you don't have these massive, long inter interiors. The departures are broken up into these canyons. And those are the actual departures there, there, and there. There's uh, trains, transport, all the public transport, etc. Sorry, on this side here. Cars on this side here. Um, and this is the actual diagram. It can grow. It's linear. It just you can grow. You can add to it. This is car parking. Uh, this is trains. Next. We've, because it's so long, and also because we like the whole enjoyment of color, um, we have used the colors of the rainbow, partly because it defines, obviously, the, the length of the building. You can see it also in a romantic way. You can see I'll meet under the, the pink column. <laughs> <laughs> Next. The interior. This is actually bamboo a very sustainable material. Next. Again, it's about detail, about the, the, both the lights, the forms. Roof lighting plays a very important part of it. In fact, uh, the canyons are heavily lit, but they're awesome. All the roof is, 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 uh, is, uh, is lit, day lit. So you can get the, uh, a minimum amount of, uh, of artificial lighting. And again, it's about scale and rhythm. Next, the baggage hall. What's I, I mean, the bridges are of glass, the floors are of glass. It's, it's extremely transparent. And rather than being squashed down as you are in our airports generally, and especially in Heathrow, um, terminals one to four, um, <laughs> uh, uh, you've got the light above you, and there is hopefully some enjoyment in actually having to wait for your bags help. And some less enjoyment probably if you lose them, but at least it's a, an enjoyable place to get angry. <laughs> <laughs> Next. And here you see the sort of whole the, the concept both of the wooden roof, the rhythm, um, and the, obviously the signaling and so on. But also the, co the whole co the coloring. Ooh. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Let me just grab a microphone and we can do a couple of questions. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to do questions. Opportunity, please don't be shy. I mean, while, while people are, are taking their notes and forming a thought or two, one of the one of the striking features across the entire body of work, from the early projects through to these these final scenes of an airport projects, uh, is clearly a kind of central role of infrastructure. I think you you mentioned it in in relation to Pompidou is the joy of movement itself, the movement of people becomes, it seems, the great engine that, that connects all of these projects in some way. And, and I guess the question that that, that that would foreground is one about how one connects across the scale of a building where the question of infrastructure is at a much more pedestrian, circulatory kind of scale to the problems of cities where infrastructures are much bigger systems, more complex um, public policy and, and construction projects and how we as architects operate across that spectrum. At the heart of this, obviously, we as individuals are the height we are. And our, the size of our hand is the, height, the size of our hand. So everything relates to that, to the eyes, the hand, to the, to the body, to the, and the machines that we make to make those things. 
So I think that's the reason that we relate all these elements, whether it's micro or macro. My point is there are certain concepts which are, are consistent, changing, continuously changing, because change is what it's all about. And as I've said before, I think we're much closer to making buildings more, uh, more like sort of robots than we are as temples. So the change is a critical, is a critical part. In terms of how of infrastructure, and obviously again, there's a difference between moving at one level between. Well, I mean, a, d a sliding door is a piece of moving a mo moving wall, and that is a dynamic. It's a division between different domains or different realms. So that too changes. Not only does it slide, but you also may need to put it somewhere else. But also within a city, and the only thing is, uh, it's a difference. I say only. It's a difference of scale. Um, it's not more difficult. I have to say, I think the house is the most difficult. That's probably the chair is the most difficult thing to design. Um, in other words, it's because there's so many have been designed, you know, uh, that it's very difficult to have very innovative ideas at the smaller scale. At least I think it's very difficult. And if, as I believe strongly, that architecture is about science as well as the uh, art of it, then the small elements are often more difficult. It may take less time. No, I doubt that as well. Um, so I, th I don't see a big difference between the small and the big, and nor do I see between the macro and the micro. The problem is, of course, that you're dealing with government. And again, I've said a, new, uh, a number of times, I think architecture is political. We deal with po at a political scale. Um, you know, we, just to get the simplest uh, piece of planning, we're, uh, we're politicians. But even in a civil society, you don't have to be an architect. You ha are, by the very word, if you're civil, um, you do believe in democracy, probably within our society, anyhow, you believe in democracy. We fought for votes. We have a right to make statements about what we believe, what's fair and what's unfair. So politics creates a very big part of it. And of course, as you get larger, it sometimes is more difficult to get things going. So I don't know again, I can't, actually I think getting house, planning for a house is probably as difficult as we'll ever get. Um, you know, it depends. I mean, and it's purely a, it's a, that's a scale problem rather than a time problem. So I would like, I would suggest we, you can link, and when I go around the work you have here and the exhibitions here, you can see that actually the same belief, thoughts go through everything, from a, through a pair of, uh, you know, a, 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 a small, something is small, it can be a, a, a teaspoon, if you like, at one level, to the city. Here we are. You talked about uh, the idea of a city and uh, 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 in, in the sense that you emphasized on the fact that walking through a city or public transport is, uh, should be really emphasized when one thinks about things of a city or plans a city. But is that, uh, can that concept be generalized? Because in, in uh, places where the climate is uh, less forgiving, like uh, say Dubai or, or more tropical regions like uh, Delhi or places like that, but it's very difficult. Uh, I mean, the idea of walking through a city in in the summer is uh, is quite uh, unpleasant, in fact. So uh, the emphasis on the car or the automobile, like you said, the percentage of tarmac in uh, in uh, Shanghai is quite high. But uh, don't you think it's uh, more dependent on the climate? Because uh, uh, it's. Uh, I mean, the car is possibly the most comfortable way of of uh, traveling through a city <laughs> in, in a weather like that. I mean, there's a number, of, isn't it? We could have at least half an hour on this one. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, first, wherever you are, you, wa you, you do some walking, even in hot climates. But what's interesting is if you go into, into a really well designed uh, village, in, even on the, in, on the Sahara, let us take, you know, place I know well, Atlas Mountains, for instance, and the deserts around it. Um, they are pretty, I mean, they deal with the climate change in a local way, and they, you know, shadow uh, materials which absorb the night cool uh, so that you can use it during the day, the use of water, uh, obviously foliage and so on. Now, that can also give you a very, a more pleasant em environment, but as far as I can think, everybody walks. I mean, you only have to go, go to an Indian city to find out how many people walk. I mean, nearly everybody walks. Um, I'm just using again that. So what I would say is, Yes, there are ways in which you can mediate, which you can am ameliorate the situation, whatever the, the, the climate is. You can do a lot if you catch the breeze. 
um, you know, just to take one simple, whereas our tendency is to sort of just blast out a building against all, so what we put a glass box up and we pump it through a full of air conditioning and the, and the sun goes on it and it beats out the heat into the, onto, the, onto the street and of course you don't want to, to walk down those streets because it's all the heat's coming back into to you, onto you. The idea is somehow to find a way of mediating, cooling, and so on. Now, I'm not against, I'm sure, as I hope that you, uh, you can see it, I'm not against technology. I'm just talking about appropriate technology. I'm not against mud bricks, as you know, I quickly have to say. It depends how you make the mud bricks and how you, uh, and how you use those mud bricks. I'm just using this, yeah, you know, I said I reuse bamboo. Um, so it's really, you know, using the appropriate materials well using the best of technology, which is what technology is about, um, and the best of design uh, in such a way as it's a pleasure to go down that street in Hawaii, which after all is a very wealthy area, so therefore there's no real excuse having all this reflective heat back into their streets, um, through, and that's the, the process of design. And I think that's where we're all moving to. to. If we're talking about tremendous reductions in energy, because we won't be here, and you know, some people who are certainly more knowledge than, our, than, our, than I, are talking about you know, 20 years, 10 years, 30 years. Certainly our children will be seriously harmed um, and, uh, and quite possibly you yourselves, because you're young, uh, within your lifetimes if we don't take action. But I don't think that means that um, you can't uh, find ways of creating env pleasurable environments in climatic terms. In fact, I think that if someone asks me what is the biggest change since I left the AA in about 1960, 59, thank you, um, uh, I, there's, no, there's no question. The biggest single change is the question of climate. Um, now, there are also sort of technological, obviously, the World Wide Web is fantastic. We, as I've said, we can, we can find out just by a click what's going on in you know, Timbuktu. Um, and therefore, that knowledge is available, and that can't be, uh, but the real, what the problem that we're solving is not, you know, the th uh, is not a piece of pure technology. It's actually a real thing, which is called climate change, and that forms our buildings. Our early buildings, and just to take the f uh, two of them that weren't up there. One, let us say, the Pompidou Center and my parents' house, uh, which are again about scale, and the juxtaposition of scale, are both basically simple platonic forms because there was no reasons not to be platonic because, um, and that's perfectly okay. Um, at, but now, as you're trying to collect sun, wind, rain, you know, whatever it may be, um, so buildings tend to adapt to those forms. Now, at one level, of course, it allows you a much greater plasticity in, f in that form, which is great. It gives you an, some further materials, some further colors. I say colors in the sense of moods, if you like, um, of art as well as, as technology. And so the building, you know, and you can see when, I, again, if you go around, you know, the exhibitions, this practically doesn't exist, the concept. I was brought up in that sort of uh, post-Mesian, post-Mesian post -Mesian period where everything was basically a cube. Um, today, there's nothing. I don't know, where does the cube? Now, I actually, there's nothing wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you know, geometry is great. Uh, it depends how you use it. So I don't want to sort of say you shouldn't have straight lines, but clearly we're moving in a different period, which is partly due to the tools that we use, starting with, uh, with, with, with a computer, but also to do with the, with the mood of the times, with the art of the times. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, I was wondering, uh, slightly more personal question maybe. You said in the beginning that you've been in the game in a long time. And uh, somehow I see throughout studying your career that your ideals and moral values into politics and the way we live has somehow been carried through all the way, even down to the line of a big, big company. And I was wondering kind of where the inspiration for those moral values comes from. I mean, was it something that was going around on the AA when you were here or before or something that formed afterwards? Um, yeah, you can always post-rationalize all these things. And it's a dull <laughs> <laughs> People say to me, "Why?" And I, I come to you. I'm just, uh, you know, people say, "Why?" Well, I'm an architect, and they say, "If you put a doctor and a potter together, then the obvious thing is an architect." That's my parents. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I mean, the sort of things that I'm talking about is not uncommon. The idea that, there, that we have to have a, a society which where there's a, a small, I mean, you know, where you are, where you, where there's a greater fairness of distribution of wealth, for instance, is pretty obvious. Um, it's very difficult to intellectually argue that some one person shown a thousand times more than another, or more, um, you know. And I don't suppose that, and whether I know that it's very dangerous for pol politicians no longer say this because they're worried that those wealthy people won't, will disappear to another country and they won't have the benefit of their taxes. But in moral terms, it must be pretty obvious. It's a moral statement. Um, that there is, there's not, so you can make an argument about that. Um, but you can turn it to an advantage, which is what I was trying to say about the office. We try to have a, we have a very strong community. I mean, practically nobody ever moves out of the office. It sometimes has disadvantages as well. Um, we, th we, are, we are a big, f a bit too big to be a family, but, it's too, but it, we used to be a, fam a more family scale than we are now. Uh, but on the other hand, we break it down so we have groups. You know, the 10 directors work, all come together all the time. Every Monday we, do not, we come together and design together, and that's like a crit. We, there's a room a bit smaller than this, and, the, and certainly smaller crowd than this, but anybody can come and we go through these projects and then we follow the projects that need further work on during the week. So we try to get that whole idea of, of distribution of knowledge as well. And so we have you know, people who are strong on one piece of, on one part of design or another part of technology and we put it together and we, that's why I believe in the whole concept of team, of team spirit. There have been things going on like this. You could go say the, the co-op, if you like. John Lewis has got, certainly got a partnership, though it's, uh, though, um, though it's not the same as ours, but John Lewis has, has some of that. There are a number of other organizations that have had this before. Um, I think one can think one's own role. You know, what, is, what am I, I as an individual, playing my tiny, tiny part within that society? What can I do? One of the things I can do is to hopefully to make it ameliorate a little bit the quality of life. But indirectly, it'll ameliorate mine too, by the way, me. I, just, I don't suffer from, it, from any of that. Then how do you actually handle that? Well, there must be a thousand ways of handling it. Different people have different views on this. I like it. We talked a lot about it. You know, Mike on over there. And, um, you know, and Mike and I have been working together since I know, another 30 more, no, 40 years. Um, you know, we play ping pong, as I call it, with, Id with ideas. Lots of others too who do, do that. What do you think, Mike? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. um, Mr. Rogers, uh, you talk about uh, the complexity, but um, um, I, I think there is a lot of merits about the compact, sustainable uh, urban development, but what do you think of uh, how complex a city will be or how, how density because I mean, like uh, London, uh, I, I mean, to me, it's really uh, ideal density. But uh, how do, uh, the, my first question is, how density a city will be uh, in your mind? And the other question is that, how you strike a balance between uh, the benefits of a complexity and the requirements of individual architecture? So, uh, such as the solar access, um, especially like uh, in the city of London, where um, solar access is quite important as well, and as well as the laws and mutual, uh, I mean, requirement. So, yeah. first of all, then let's mix up high rise and and, and density. Um, Though obviously, as I said, if you get to Chicago, there is a direct link between high rise or New York or Hong Kong, Shanghai. Uh, but in our sort of, specifically I'd say in Europe, there's very little relationship with height, between height and density. Um, in terms of, I mean, I think there are many cities. I love New York. I have no problems with that. But I also, I, there's no reason why I, I enjoy, you know, uh, as I said, Barcelona at eight stories or Madrid. Um, there are lots of cities which are of, of uh, you can get immense densities of four, five, st uh, four, st five stories. Um, some 50 years ago, some wonderful studies by Leslie Martin, when I was, remember when I was a student here, and Lionel March, uh, on geometry and form and the city, at, at, down at Cambridge Land, something or the other, I can't remember what it was called, um, Land Lab, um, which shows a link between layouts of cities and densities. In terms of, 
Again, density, I'm not saying you should, that you, if, I mean, it's your choice. I, my only point that I'm making is that in terms of environmental sustainability to start with, there's actually the Sierra Club made an interesting little statement that which showed that it's better to have a leaky, uh, a, a leaky uh, old house in a city in terms of energy than a beautifully up-to-date, environmentally friendly house in the countryside when you start building up what the real energy really is. One of the problems about, the, uh, about moving out of the city is not only, of course, uh, the factor of meeting with people and so on, and the whole concept of community. But of course, that what we do is we leave the city, which has got emptying schools, em half empty hospitals, schools, institutions, police, and so on. And we have to reestablish that on a, uh, on a very much uh, lower density element. It's very expensive in energy and expensive in every other, in every other way. We calculated if for every house built in the country, in the countryside, the taxpayer uh, would pay well over 100,000 pounds this is an average house, to if the, if the real price was put forward for all those, in, and not only just for transport and, or for electricity and gas, but for all those social elements that you had to support it. So it's very expensive in financial, it's very expensive in energy, which doesn't mean that you shouldn't live, you know, you're, then it's your decision if you want to live in, in, in the country. Um, and you, there are ways that you can ameliorate that too. You know, if you can find some public transport near you, you can also do, uh, do that. Density is about, also about public domain. How much public domain you can get? I mean, there are lots of very good studies, I've seen them here too, about how you can have you know, a lot of, uh, of private space, gardens and so on, up to quite a high, you know, six, seven stories, not very difficult. Um, and if you have good parks outside, well, maybe that's sufficient. I'm not, I'm not pro, uh, I'm certainly not against saying um, there's a good tradition of uh, two, three-story high-density developments. Actually, some fantastic traditions of two, three-story. I'm not arguing for eight or 16-story. So I'm just arguing, arguing for well-planned, dense cities starting on brownfield sites if you're uh, doing a regeneration on public transport with good gardens, good public domain. I don't, I mean, I think there's no specific reason why offices shouldn't be high-rise. I mean, I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not even getting involved in the discussion of what happens to St. Paul's um, or whatever else, which is where our corridors are, uh, are mm. to it. Um, and there is an argument for making different things. You know, I think there's a quality about that, let's say, Paris has, which is of a, a quality, and there's a fantastic quality of Chicago when you get to Chicago. So these, I like the disparity and the differences of, the, of those sort of situations. I'm not putting down an idea that when I said dense compact, I'm not saying therefore high rise or low rise. I'm just saying design it well, but specifically densify ra ra where you've got the right infrastructure. I think there's one person trying in the dark to Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't even take it off. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me how many floors are here? <laughs> it's, a, it's about all those things you've just said. I think you just said it probably. Um, it's really about the fact that we, we are humorous. We are, I mean, if you look at it in one level, of course, we mustn't take ourselves too seriously. Um, we have to take, um, and I suppose that's really what it's about. It's, uh, it's about, it has a bit of structure. It's about technology, which is one of my interests or our interests. Um, it's about colour, it's about people, and it's about the humour of life. But you could take that one off, actually, whatever you like. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? One more question, is there? I think we'll stop there. Richard, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you.